Orville and Wilbur Wright would stand in awe of today's flying machines. Not only are they flying faster and farther than ever before, some can even do it without a single human being on board. For years, drones have been making headlines all over the world as platforms for military strikes. That's why many people associate drones with modern warfare. But what is a drone? Drones, also known as Unmanned Aerial Vehicles or UAVs, are machines that take to the air without the control of a human pilot on board, but rather from control pods on the ground. Some drones can even fly themselves without any need for human intervention at all. These machines come in all shapes and sizes, each made to address different tasks, none of which have anything to do with military aggression. Drones are on the cusp of transforming all sorts of industries and could revolutionize our lives in ways we could have only imagined just a few years ago. Everyone knows that farming and ranching is difficult work, made all the more challenging when landowners must monitor thousands of acres to check on crops and livestock. Drones allow farmers and ranchers to take to the skies to look for signs of disease in the herd, or to examine crops and even apply chemicals like fertilizer or herbicide. Not only does this save a lot in fuel costs for ground vehicles and agricultural aircraft, it can also result in better land management, which could help improve overall yields. Drones can even help farmers to secure their property and equipment via remote aerial surveillance. Law enforcement agencies, on the other hand, must apply for the proper permits or warrants before deploying drones to watch citizens and some have already done so, primarily to monitor areas for illegal drug transactions, conduct chases, or even help with crime scene reconstruction. Police can also put drones to work on search and rescue missions, or to perform routine security sweeps at large crowded events. However, most police forces haven't put drones to large-scale use as of yet, in large part due to privacy concerns. Scientists are always looking for new ways to probe and investigate severe weather. In 2013, NASA began a program for investigating tropical storms, hoping to gain a better understanding of why some storms turn into killer hurricanes while others lose their energy and die. For these missions, the researchers use the enormous Global Hawk drones, which have a wingspan as wide as a 737 and can fly for up to 31 hours non-stop at a maximum altitude of 60,000 feet and a range of 11,000 plus nautical miles. Equipped with scientific instruments including a scanning high-resolution interferometer sounder instrument and cloud physics LIDAR, as well as a drop sonde system from the National Oceanographic and Atmosphere Association, the drones can provide a constant stream of data regarding atmospheric conditions and storm intensity. Together, these tools stream data about layered temperatures within a storm, cloud structure, and more providing scientists with a look at the internal structure of a weather system. Thanks in part to drones, researchers are getting a better view and understanding of how all the factors fit together. Natural resource departments and scientists also use drones to track wildlife or individual animals, which may or may not be wearing tracking collars, in order to better understand their behaviors. Without UAVs, scientists are often forced to fight their way through jungles and over mountains while hauling unwieldy and expensive gear in order to conduct their research. Drones, however, let them effortlessly observe habitats and animals from a distance without disturbing them. Drones are already being used to combat poachers. In fact, Google is funding a program that buys drones for the World Wildlife Fund which flies camera-equipped versions above areas where illegal hunting threatens endangered animals. Law enforcement can use the drones to monitor animals and anticipate potential ambush areas. 
Small and nearly silent, these drones are perfect for spying on criminals looking to capture or kill endangered animals for profit on the black market. Drones can also help in the aftermath of a natural disaster, when authorities need to perform damage assessment, so they know how many people are affected and how widespread the damage might be. Drones are a cheap and efficient way to put many sets of digital eyes in the sky. They can fly far and wide through an area, following a precise search pattern in order to locate missing people. They can help first responders like police and fire units figure out where to set up temporary staging areas. They can spot survivors and even listen for sounds, or pinpoint the location of bodies. Even if streets are blocked by impassable debris, drones can immediately take to the air and begin providing critical data. This kind of capability could make the difference between life or death for untold numbers of people. In one case, the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection launched a Predator drone courtesy of the state's National Guard unit. The Predator was loaded with cameras and infrared units to help it track the infamous Rim Fire, which burned through the forests around Yosemite National Park. Drones can even drop flame retardant to douse fires that threaten to burn out of control. Professional and amateur photographers and filmmakers are some of the biggest proponents of UAVs. They buy many of the more affordable models, tweak them, and use them for all sorts of still image and video projects. Many current drones come with mounting kits that let you attach a camera to the underside of the machine. With the camera in place, a photographer or videographer has a new world of creative potential at his or her command for stunning aerial shots that were impossible without a helicopter or giant lift before affordable drones came along. Now, the skies are open to anyone who's willing to trust the small drone with their camera gear. Offshore oil rigs are notoriously hard to access. They're miles out at sea, with 184 rigs in the Gulf of Mexico alone. With drones, engineers on shore can look for safety problems, detect oil leaks, and monitor weather conditions in the area. Natural gas and oil require many miles of pipeline, and it was tough for companies to keep tabs on them. Now they can simply program a few drones to fly along a pipeline, and the automated camera can send back a stream of images that can detect problems, whether they are nearby or in extremely remote locations. Underwater drones also have almost limitless uses particularly in the areas of oceanographic research, undersea pipeline maintenance and repair, marine salvage, and deep sea exploration. The oceans are still the most unknown and unexplored area of scientific research, but new deep sea drones are now opening new exploration opportunities, helping scientists to better understand our oceans and the marine life they contain. They also allow researchers to monitor the ocean floor for geological activity, which could save untold lives from tsunamis and earthquakes caused by tectonic shifts in the ocean depths. Drones are literally making possible jobs that are too hard or too dangerous for people to perform, as well as becoming one of the most popular hobbies for people of all ages and in all walks of life. But for all the capabilities of drones and their many uses, it is important to remember that the technologies that made it all possible were designed for a much more deadly purpose during the wars that we have fought. Unmanned aerial vehicles popularly known as drones are the most often associated with airstrikes and modern warfare. But their history goes much farther back than that. While drones come into the spotlight during recent years, the idea of a remotely operated flying machine was developed much earlier. An early forerunner of an unmanned aerial vehicle was an Austrian balloon used during the Siege of Venice in 1849. 
The balloons were filled with explosives and launched from an Austrian ship anchored near Venice. The wind was intended to carry the balloons, which would be triggered by electromagnetism, through a long copper wire. Due to unpredictable weather, the project was limited in success, but the idea remained for further development. During World War I, many eccentric weapons were developed on all sides of the conflict. One was the pilotless aircraft that operated with the help of Archibald Lowe's revolutionary radio control techniques. The Ruston Proctor aerial target was the cutting edge of drone technology in 1916. Lowe, nicknamed the father of radio guidance systems, was happy for the project to be developed further and used in kamikaze style ramming strikes against zeppelins. Another project that led the way for further research of UAVs was the Hewitt Sperry automatic airplane, also known as the Flying Bomb, or the Aerial Torpedo. It went from Britain to the USA in 1917, resulting in an upgraded American version named the Kettering Bug. Although it was considered to be a large success, the war ended before it could be utilized. Because drones were meant to be recovered and reused, the automatic airplane was more a predecessor of the cruise missile than the UAV. Considering that the 20th century saw the parallel development of both weapons, it is almost impossible to separate their origins. After World War I, there was a lot of interest in producing and improving remote-controlled flying weapons. The U.S. Army took the initiative in further exploring the concepts. After the war, three standard E-1 biplanes were converted into UAVs. While the Americans were laying the groundwork for drones, the British Royal Navy conducted tests of an aerial torpedo design, such as the Larynx. In 1927 and 1929, the Larynx was launched from warships under autopilot. Pilotless aircraft were also made as aerial targets. Among the projects used for the target practice was the DH-82B Queen Bee, which was derived from the de Havilland Tiger Moth biplane trainer and was adapted to the new radio control technology. The name Queen Bee is believed to have introduced the term drone into general use. Once World War II broke out, it began to represent any remotely controlled pilotless aerial vehicle. At the outbreak of World War II, an impressive person rose to prominence in the field of radio control research. Reginald Denny went from England to the United States in 1919, intending to become an actor in Hollywood. But besides his acting career, Reginald, together with his partners, opened Reginald Denny Industries and a shop that specialized in model planes called the Reginald Denny Hobby Shops, which later evolved into the Radio Plane Company and Denny offered his target drones to the military. Denny and his company produced 15,000 target drones for the U.S. Army to train anti-aircraft crews just before and during World War II. His famous model was called Radio Plane OQ-2. During the late 1930s, the U.S. Navy developed the Curtis N2C-2. This unmanned aerial vehicle was remotely controlled from another aircraft which made the design revolutionary. The U.S. Army Air Force also adopted this concept and started improving it. The primary use of the technology was still as target practice for anti-aircraft gunners. However, as America was preparing for war, the UAV experiments were being redirected for combat use. In 1940, the TDN-1 assault drone was capable of carrying a 1,000-pound bomb and was deemed fit for service. It was easy to produce and passed most tests. However, the drone was too hard to control, and as complications were expected once it entered combat conditions, it never saw action. 
During Operation Aphrodite in 1944, some modified B-17 Flying Fortresses and B-24 Liberator heavy bombers were used as enormous aerial torpedoes. But they also failed to see wider service. They proved to be ineffective. One of the reasons why the concept was abandoned was the death of Joseph Kennedy Jr., brother of the future president, who died alongside his crew member during one of the raids as part of Operation Aphrodite. The development of pulse jet engines enabled the Germans to produce the fearsome V-1 flying bomb, which at the time represented the pinnacle of guided missile systems. The V-1 flying bomb was the first cruise missile ever built. It was built at the Penamunde Army Research Center and first tested in 1942. The V-1 was intended to target London and was massively fired, achieving more than 100 launches a day. The V-1 was launched from a rail system to achieve the speed needed to operate its pulse jet engine and would achieve a 250 km radius at one point flying at 640 km per hour. Germany fired 9,521 V-1 bombs on southern England. Of these, 4,621 were destroyed by anti-aircraft fire or by RAF fighters, such as the new turbojet fighter, the Gloucester Meteor. So the next time you prepare for a day of recreational aerial photography with your favorite camera drone, or read about how drones help to find and save lives during the aftermath of a natural disaster. Take a moment to remember the estimated 6,100 people who were killed by the V-1 flying bombs and others who lost their lives at the mercy of these flying technological wonders. They are the people who suffered the pain of progress.